Well, once again, thank you for being here. All righty, let's go ahead and, and kind of uh, jump in this tonight. This part, as I said, is not in your notes, so you can either just listen or you can, you can make some notes. It's kind of hard because I know you don't have any extra paper. But I wanted to throw in something that I, I should have done before, but I had a weak moment. And I, I need to spend a few moments tonight on inspiration refers not only to the Old Testament, but also to the New Testament and the idea of equality. In other words, the Old Testament and the New Testament are both inspired, they're both God-breathed, and they are both equal. So it's not that the Old Testament is greater than the New Testament, the New Testament is greater than the Old Testament in regards to its value, its concepts, and its words. Now, last time, let's do a little bit of review. We said that the Bible was inspired verbally. What did we mean by verbally? Anybody, just throw it out. What? Look back in your notes, those of you that were here and took notes. If someone were to come up, if you were on Jeopardy and they asked you the question, okay, what does it mean that the Bible is verbally inspired? Well, what would you say? God breathed. Well, yeah, that's, that, that's the word inspiration. Okay, all right, good. The idea of verbal means written. So the written word, let me grab my Bible here. When we talk about verbally inspired, we're talking about the written word. And we're talking about every word, every word. So the written word is what we call verbally inspired. And then when we talk about plenary, if somebody were to ask you, what is the plenary inspiration of the Bible? It means what? All of it. So we have verbal, the written, every word, and we have plenary, all of it. So if somebody were to ask us here at Bangor Baptist Church, what do you believe about the Bible? Do you believe the Bible is inspired? Do you believe the Bible is God-breathed supernaturally? We would say, yes, we do. And we would believe in the verbal, plenary inspiration as it relates to the original autographs. All right, so this Bible that I hold in my hand, this NASB, NAS Study Bible, New American Standard Bible, and we call them a study Bible because they have notes at the bottom. And some people say, what's a study Bible? Well, it's a Bible that has the verses at the top and it has notes on the bottom. Now, the notes on the bottom aren't necessarily always correct because they are man's interpretation of the verses. So sometimes on the bottom, they, they do the best they can, but don't worry so much about the notes as the scriptures. The scriptures are true, the notes, I mean, it's not that they're not true, but once again, that comes from man. The scripture comes from God, okay? But that's the definition of a study Bible with, with notes at the bottom. Now, as we think about this Bible, uh, this Bible is inspired, God-breathed, only in the sense that it mirrors the original. So if someone were to ask me, Jerry, do you believe that the Bible you're holding is inspired? My answer would be yes and no. Yes and no. It's not inspired from the sense that this is not the original. I mean, I'm not holding the first Bible that God gave to man. This isn't it. I am holding a copy that has been handed down literally over thousands of years, copy after copy after copy. And you remember the first night that we met, we put a particular speech on the screen. You remember what that was? Gettysburg Address, that's right. And we said, if everybody in here would copy the Gettysburg Address, I promise you that every single one of you would not copy it exactly like was on the screen. But from all of the copies, we could match those against each one of them, one at a time, and we could come up with pretty much the original one. I mean, we would know exactly what it would say. So we do not have the original autographs inspired, but we, I would say we don't have it inspired in the original autographs, but we have it God-breathed inspired in so much as we believe it's been accurately translated and preserved and copied down through the centuries. So you need to understand the difference. So if you hear a preacher get up in the pulpit and say, we have the inspired Word of God. Well, you're going to learn a little bit later on, a few months down the road, 
some people believe, for example, that the King James Bible is inspired, the 1611 one. We're going to talk about that. So some preachers would say, well, we actually have new inspiration. There's a word for that, heresy. <laughs> That's the word for that, uh, heresy. Okay? That's not true. But they believe that. So if a pastor says we have the inspired word of God, you kind of have to ask him what he means. Because sometimes I will say that in preaching. We have the inspired word of God. Well, we do. As much as in regards to the originals, how it's been copied and translated. All right, so we need to understand these terms. Uh, one of the goals of this class is to go slow. And I'm going as slow peg as I can go. If I go any slower, I'm going to be stopped. And I'm repeating myself week after week because I want to make sure you understand the concepts. When we think about inspiration, there are three areas that we've talked about. First of all, there's revelation. That's the revealing of truth not known until God gives it. So God gave his revelation, and the way of recording it and receiving it, man does that through inspiration, and how we understand it and interpret it is through illumination. So you and I here at Bangor Baptist would say that we believe in the verbal plenary inspiration of the Bible. We believe it has been revealed by God, inspired in the sense it's been recorded and written down by man through a supernatural process called inspiration, and that through the Holy Spirit, God gives us illumination to understand the Word of God. There, there's the answer. Does that make sense? You're looking at me kind of funny, like I have no idea what you're talking about. Go back and read your notes. It's all there. All right, so up to this point, that's kind of what we've learned so far. Now, what we need to talk about tonight, and we'll add a few things here, is that the Old Testament and the New Testament are both revelation from God, inspired in its recording, and God through the Holy Spirit can illuminate us to understand what God has given us. That's very important. God's not going to give us a book that we don't understand. That would not make any sense at all. So on what basis then can inspiration be extended to the New Testament? Because the verses that we typically use and have used, you might recall, refer to the Old Testament. The Old Testament. So Jerry, what can you give me to say the New Testament is inspired or God-breathed just like the Old Testament. Well, I'm so glad you asked. Okay, here are some few points. Number one, the Apostle Paul, or Peter rather, classes the epistles of Paul or the letters of Paul along with other scriptures of the Old Testament. Now, this is important. So Peter here has a couple of verses that I'm going to show you. And he deals, he talks about Paul's letters and he classes them on the same level as the Old Testament which is very, very important for all of us uh, to understand. It's absolutely very, very important that we get that. Well, let's look at the verse together. Here it is. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul. So we have Peter and Paul. According to the wisdom given him, Wisdom given to whom? Paul, very good. Wrote to you, Peter addresses individuals, as also in all his letters, that's his epistles, the writings of Paul, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort. He's talking about those that are lost or false teachers, they're, they're distorting the Bible. As they do also, notice here, the, let's say it together, rest of the scriptures. So in other words, Peter says, people are distorting the writings of Paul, which is New Testament revelation, as they are the Old Testament revelation. So Peter puts Paul's writings on the same level as what? The Old Testament. You with me? You got that? Understand that? So if somebody says, well, how do you know the New Testament is inspired? We know the Old Testament is because, you know, Moses was involved and all these guys, but what about the New Testament? Peter says in this scripture, 
that the writings of Paul are equated with the rest of the scriptures. Now, the rest of the scriptures are not the rest of Paul's writings. The scriptures are referring to the Old Testament. Very, very crucial for us to get. Another point that we need to get, the apostle Paul writes to a young preacher. The young preacher's name is Timothy. And sometimes people get it confused. They read the book of Timothy, they think Timothy wrote it. Timothy did not write it. Now, Peter wrote Peter, but Timothy did not write Timothy. The apostle Paul wrote to a young evangelist, a young church planter, a young preacher named Timothy. So it'd be like if I was gonna write Pastor Tom a letter, we would, we would call the letter Tom. And then I would say, I, Jerry, an apostle, and, and then of course the writing would be to Tom. That's what happened here in this situation. Now, in 1 Peter 5.18, as Paul writes Timothy, he quotes a passage from Luke. Now that's important because Luke lived before or after Paul. What do you think? Before. All right, very good. So Luke's scripture would be previous to Paul's scripture. Now we know Paul had an unusual experience, did he not, in the book of Acts? Does anybody know where he was going when the light hit him, kind of like this light is hitting me right now? I feel like Paul right now. And, and all of a sudden, something happens, and he loses his sight, and he falls down. There's a voice. Where was he going? The road to? Damascus. Very good. Paul comes to the Lord. God revealed himself to Paul in a supernatural way. And there's something else we need to understand, and there's so many different roads we can go off when we teach this material, is not everybody has an Apostle Paul experience in salvation. The Bible was written to give us what we call the macro understanding of biblical Christianity. It's the big picture. Not everybody has the same experiences as people in the Bible. For example, I'm never going to be in a lion's den and probably not get eaten by a lion. I mean, I'm not going to go to the zoo and jump in where all the lions are and watch them go to sleep. I'm not going to do that because I'm not Daniel, right? And same with Noah. God's not going to use us to do something on a whole world scale that's never been done before. These are macro illustrations to teach us about the power of God and the history of the church and God's people, Israel. Those, of course, being separated. Today, Israel has been kind of placed on the back burner. And right now, God is dealing with the Gentile or the church. And the church also includes the Messianic Jew. The Messianic Jew, the definition for a Messianic Jew, and somebody recently said, Jerry, what is a Messianic Jew? What does that mean? It's a Jew that believes and receives Jesus as their, i.e., Messiah. That's why they call him a Messianic Jew. They are a Jew, but they believe in the Messiah. They believe the Messiah is whom? Jesus. So Jews for Jesus, that organization that we support, uh, they are all Messianic Jews. So there are Jews that believe in Jesus, they're Messianic Jews, and the Jews that do not believe in Jesus are just called Jews. All right, very important. Now, notice here. For the scripture says, this is 1 Timothy 5.18, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Paul, in writing to Timothy, quotes some work done by the doctor. If you don't know, Luke was a physician. He was a medical doctor. He's a very smart guy, obviously. And his writing is different from some of the other books because he uses very technical kind of writing because he was very well educated, obviously. But notice what Paul does. Luke, in chapter 10, verse 7, in his letter or his book, stay in that house eating and drinking what they give you for the laborer is worthy of his wages. So Paul writes, and he borrows from Luke. Now, let's think now. Peter has already equated the scripture writing of Paul as equal with the Old Testament. Okay, you with me, all right? Stay with me here, it gets a little deep. So Peter's already done that. He's already placed Paul's writing on the level with the Old Testament. 
Paul borrows from Luke, therefore, right, by implication, Paul has raised Luke up to obviously his level, which is the same level as the Old Testament. So here we have the Old Testament we know is Scripture, we know the writings of Paul are Scripture, and now we know the writings of Luke are Scripture. So these are some concepts or implications that show us that the New Testament is on par with the Old Testament. All prophetic writings, Old Testament and New Testament, are God-given or inspired. Notice what Peter says, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. But know this first of all, that no prophecy, no writings, nothing that has come from God of Scripture. Now, Scripture refers really to a dichotomy here. It refers to the Old Testament. It also refers to the New Testament because Peter is already given Paul's writing an equation with the Old Testament. So what he's saying is Old Testament, New Testament, is a matter of one's own interpretation for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. No prophecy should be interpreted privately by anybody. Now, we can go a lot of ways with this, but what it means is when God gave us the Bible, and I'm not saying we have the market on this, but we're doing our best. Wouldn't it make sense? Let's just use practical horse sense. Or we say in Missouri, mule sense. I won't use the real word they normally use. It has three letters. We won't say that, right? Okay. But good old mule donkey sense, donkey sense. Wouldn't it matter or make sense that God would give us a book and really there's only one interpretation? Now think about that. If you were going to leave instructions for, let's say, your child or your mother, your father, your friend, or your employee, would you want to write them a note? Let's say you had, maybe it was a lot of things. Maybe it was a whole page. You were going away for a month, and you were going to leave the business, and wouldn't you want to write something where they could just interpret it? How many ways? One way. Of course you would. I mean, you would not want them to read that paper and say, oh, well, yeah, I know what that says, but I can interpret that the way I want to, and I'll do it my way. It doesn't really matter. It does matter. It matters a whole lot. And the way we got to where we are today, we've already covered, right? We've already talked about modernism. We've talked about neo-orthodoxy. We've already talked about how we've come to where we've come, why there's so much confusion in the church. False teaching and man's pride and arrogance has gotten in the way of orthodoxy, which you know what is now because you've been here for the last five or six weeks. Orthodoxy is defined, let's do it again, orthodoxy is that the Bible is the Word of God. That's orthodoxy, the Bible is the Word of God. Modernism or liberalism is the Bible contains, very good, Kevin, contains the Word of God. Neo-orthodoxy is the Bible becomes the Word of God when we have this personal experience, and then the Bible becomes the Word of God. So we have is the Word of God, that would be us, contains the Word of God, or becomes the Word of God. All right, so we see here that God meant for his Bible to be interpreted one particular way. All right, this is in your notes. Inspiration includes a variety of literary styles and sources. A bunch of literary styles and sources. Now, there are several factors in the makeup of Scripture that support this idea. Let's take a look at them. There is a marked difference we need to understand in vocabulary and style from writer to writer. Uh, this is one way that we know that the Bible was not given by dictum or dictation. Uh, I believe there were certain parts of the Bible uh, that were given by dictation. Uh, for example, the Ten Commandments. God <laughs> told him what to write. Hey, Moses, write this down just this way. That's, that's clearly 
All right, so we don't want to say that there are no parts of the Bible that was not done robotically or dictation, but as a general sense, men wrote the Bible their own style, their own way of writing as the Holy Spirit led them uh, to do so. Let me just give you uh, a, a couple of examples. For example, uh, this part's not in your notes. Compare the powerful literary expressions of the book of Isaiah, for example, to the mournful tones of Jeremiah. Now you say, well, I don't know what those are. If you take time, maybe this week, you just go to flip through the book of Isaiah, and then you flip through the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is mourning. The book of Jeremiah is about a prophet, Jeremiah, who's warning Israel to smarten up or God is going to nail us. He's talking to Judah, southern Israel, and he says, look what's happened to our brothers and sisters in the north. They've been taken by Assyria, and God is going to punish us if we don't start doing right. The prophets, the priests, had all gone bad. The priests were corrupt. They had gone liberal. They were in it for themselves. And so Jeremiah writes, and he says, we need to repent. You guys need to repent. The nation needs to repent. And it's a very sad book. The book of Lamentations is Jeremiah lamenting. It's not the most upbeat book in the world uh, to read, but he's lamenting over Israel of their sin and the priesthood and all those that are not following God. Another example is if you compare the complex literary construction of Hebrews. Hebrews is kind of a difficult book to really, to really read. I mean, you got to really go slow, take your time. The book of Hebrews is telling us, as Paul wrote the book, that we are no longer worshiping by bringing animals to the temple. There's a new sheriff in town, and his name is Jesus. And Jesus is the Lamb of God. And it's kind of a, a book that teaches us that the old way of worship in the Old Testament is dead, and the new worship is Jesus. That's the book of Hebrews. Now, it's kind of hard as you go through it, if you've taken time to read it, just read some of it this week and, and see if I'm right versus the simplicity of style in John. I mean, John is a very easy book to read, right? Very easy book to read. You have great stories, the woman at the well. You have uh, chapter 3, who was it that came to Jesus by night? Nicodemus, very good. Many other stories in the book of John. It's very easy to read. So when we suggest to new believers, and this would be something you could do, if you know somebody who's recently come to faith, and they say, where should I start reading the Bible? Don't tell them Leviticus, okay? Don't tell them Leviticus. That's a bad idea, okay? In fact, don't say anything in the Old Testament except maybe Proverbs and Psalms. Tell them to start in the book of John. John is not part of the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels, that word simply means similar or like, is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So you put those three over here, and, and those three books are similar in the sense that they contain a lot of the same material, just written from a different perspective. So it would be like if, uh, oh, I don't know, somebody ran down the aisle and they tripped, and three of us saw it. We all would write the same incident, but I guarantee you they'd all be different. Some of you would mention chairs in the auditorium. Uh, one of you would not mention chairs. One would mention it happened during church. Others would not mention it happened during church. But the whole purpose of the writing is somebody ran and fell in the aisle, okay? So we have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they're the synoptic gospels. John is what we call more of a universal book. It doesn't have the same stories. I think maybe there's one or two, but basically it's much different than the synoptic gospels. And the whole idea of the book of John, we call it the universal book in the sense that John writes to the whole world to say that Jesus is the way to heaven. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God. And he presents Jesus as the Savior to the world. That's the book of John. So it's very easy to read. This week, take a chapter. Just read the book of John. Very easy, not hard to understand at all, not complex. But Hebrews can be kind of tough. Notice another example, the more technical language of Luke. Uh, Luke is a physician. He's more of a technical writer. Why? Because he's a doctor. I'm not sure how they read his writing to copy it anyway. You know, doctors, 
You know, you get some of the doctor, it looks like hieroglyphics or something. But uh, he, he's very technical in his writing. And if you contrast that, for example, to the pastoral images of James, and, and James uses examples, you know, like plants and, and athletics and agriculture and, and, and those kinds of things to help uh, share these images that we get. So once again, we have some contrasting uh, understandings uh, of books. Uh, the Bible makes use, by the way, of what we call non-biblical documents. Non-biblical documents. Uh, there are many, and we don't have time to look at all of them, but we're going to look at a couple tonight. There are so many places in the Bible that refer to non-biblical documents, what we call secular documents. So let's take a couple look at those. Joshua chapter 10, verse 13. So the sun stood still. This is a great story. Do you know the story of Joshua chapter 10? Let me tell you the story just for fun because I love these old stories. Well, we find that Israel under Joshua goes in to the land. They're getting ready to, in fact, they've already taken the land. The first battle is they go in to take the land that God promised to who in chapter 12 of Genesis? Abraham, right, Abraham. Hundreds of years have passed. Now they're ready to take the land. After they've spent 40 years, the nation of Israel, on a vacation in the desert because of their sin, their lack of faith. After their 40 years of vacation, and every man over the age of 20 had to die. Can you imagine that? Then God said, take the land. So Joshua gets the troops and says, here we go. And there were two spies, Joshua and Caleb. Very, very good. We'll put an extra star by your name on that one. Caleb. And Joshua leads them into battle. The first battle is the Battle of Jericho. Remember, they marched around how many times? Seven times. Very good. So they marched around seven times, and the walls come down. Very, very good. All right, so that's that battle. And if you're on God's team, we won that one pretty good. Hands down. Wiped them right out, right? All right, the second battle is the Battle of Ai. You say, how do you spell that, Jerry? Ai. Pretty simple. Ai. That's how it's spelled. That's how it's pronounced. But, you know, Israel got a little cocky in this battle. A lot like we do sometimes. And they thought, well, this little place of AI, we can handle these guys, so we'll just kind of send the B team. So they didn't really send enough troops, and they really didn't pray, they really didn't lean on God that much. And they go in, and they got their tails kicked. In fact, I think they lost about 36 men died, and it was a very embarrassing, and they got beat. We got beat, because we're on Israel's time, on team, right? So they get beat. Well, they found out that something had happened. There was sin in the camp. And a guy named Aiken, who was getting ready to be Aiken here a little bit later, let me tell you. Uh, Aiken had stole some stuff, and he put it under his tent. And when they went into AI, the rules were, don't take anything. But just like many of us today, the things of this world look really good, don't they? And he took some of the jewels and some other nice clothing, wingtip shoes, you know, things like that. And he had a bunch of stuff, and he hit them. Uh, that was a bad, bad mistake. And finally, they found out who it was, and they took care of him. Not only him, but his family and his extended family. And he died. Well... Then they went back and they wiped out AI. So we got Jericho down, we got AI down. We're going to keep marching on into the promised land. Here we go. Well, there was a, there was a place called Gibeon, interesting place. And the Gibeonites saw what happened at Jericho and... Very good. And they go, wow, we don't know this God these guys are worshiping fully, but we know one thing, no one's been able to stand up to them yet. So what they decided to do is they made a peace treaty with Israel. I mean, that's probably a smart thing if you think about it. So they make a peace treaty. But there were other people around the area that got very concerned about that because they said, wow, wait a minute now. If Gibeon makes a peace treaty with Israel, what if they both ganged up on us? So the king of Jerusalem got together and he sent out some text messages and he had a meeting. And he pulled together four other kings, the Amorites, and he said, hey, we got to stick together. If not, we're going to hang separately. Very good. we got to stick together. And if not, we're in trouble because this Israel, these guys are marching through. And boy, now they've joined with Gibeon. 
and Gibeon might join with them and attack us. And so what happens is, is they have a battle. They invade Gibeon first. And the Gibeonites are fighting, and they're going, man, this isn't going real well. I mean, this isn't going real well at all. In fact, I think we're going to lose the battle. So they send a guy to Israel, to Joshua. And he gets there, he says, hey, remember, we have a peace treaty with you, and we're losing, and we're going to lose. And Joshua says, no worries. And so he rallies the troops. Dun, 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 dun. I love these stories. And here comes the Israelites, and they're coming to the rescue. And the Gibeonites are getting beat, and just when they're just about out of it, here comes Israel, and they come racing in. And sure enough, the king of Jerusalem and all those other kings, they go, uh-oh, we're in trouble. And there's an interesting verse in verse 13 of chapter 10 in the battle. This is a very controversial verse. The neo-Orthodox crew and the liberals, the modernists, cannot accept that this actually happened. But those of us that are orthodox, which you now know what that means, because we believe the Bible is the Word of God, right? Doesn't contain the Word of God, doesn't become the Word of God, is the Word of God. We say this is an actual supernatural event that happened. Notice what happens. During the battle, so the sun stood still. I read one commentary and I about fell out of my chair. One of these liberals said, here's what it means. It means that it just wasn't as hot as it normally was, and there were clouds, and it was cooler, so men could fight better. About that time, I had to go to the bathroom. That's how bad it was. I mean, that's how bad it was. I mean, the liberals are always trying to their very best to do everything they can to discard the supernatural. They cannot come to the place where they believe in the supernatural. Well, here's what I believe. I believe that God, in the heat of the battle... Had the sun stayed longer than normally so they could have light to wipe out the kings. That's what the Bible says. So the sun stood still. What does that mean? It means, I looked it up, the sun stood still. That's what it means. Okay? It's exactly what it means. And the moon stopped. They had him over the moon. Have you heard that expression? Until the nation, until the nation avenged themselves of their enemies. I mean, God looked down and said, hey, we're doing good, fellas, but you need a little bit more time. I'm just going to hold things up a bit. Now, that could be considered when the guys got home that night, honey, I've had a long day, okay? So when the sun stands still, you can go home and say, I've had a long day. Notice, this is good stuff. Is not this written in the book of Jashar? What is that? Never saw that before, did you? What is that? What's the book of Joshua? That, that's not in the Old Testament. Why? Aha, we're getting there. And the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and did not hasten to go down for a whole day. And I'll add an until we killed them all. I like that. It's a great story. Read it tonight. Put you right to sleep. Joshua chapter 10. Good stuff. All right, now. The book of Jashar, that's a very interesting book. The book of Jashar is not canonical. In other words, it's not inspired. It's not part of our 66 books. It was a secular book written around this time, and it highlights the heroes and the wars of Israel. And here's what Joshua was saying. And this is really good because, once again, it gives us one more confirmation of inspiration that we receive through revelation. And now I'm teaching you so you can receive and understand illumination, so you can understand it, right? Here it is. Joshua was saying, as he wrote this book, if you don't believe the story, if you don't think I'm telling you the truth, go read it in the book of Jashar. That's what he was saying. Because he knew people wouldn't believe it. And the book of Jashar records the event. A secular book records the event. And Joshua knew this was going to be a situation that was going to be difficult to believe. Now, for me, it's pretty simple. I believe if God created the sun, he can stop it whenever he wants. I mean, to me, it's not even a 
you know, blip on the radar screen. But it is to the modernist and the neo-orthodox person that can't come to grips in orthodoxy. So that's the book of Jashar. Now, there's other books that I didn't, I mean, I, you know, you can go on forever. But let me just give you a couple of more, for example, books that are mentioned in the Bible. The Book of the Wars of the Lord. There's another one. That's mentioned in Numbers chapter 21. Here's another one. The Book of Samuel the Seer. Here's another one. The Book of Nathan the Prophet. These are not canonical in the sense that they're part of the 66 books. Here's one. The Book of Gad the Seer. That's mentioned in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. There's also a book called the Acts of Rehoboam. The Acts of Rehoboam. And there's another one here called Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. You can read about that in 1 Kings chapter 14. We also know that Solomon, now we all know who Solomon was. Who was Solomon's dad? David, okay, good. Solomon, according to the Bible, in 1 Kings chapter 4, tells us that Solomon wrote 1,000 songs. 1,000 songs. That's a lot. But do you realize out of those thousand songs that there's only two in the book of Psalms? And they are found in Psalm 72 and Psalm 127. Psalm 72 and Psalm 127. The other 998 are not in the Bible. So what does that tell us? It tells us just like today, there's a lot of other things that are written that have not been saved or put into the Bible. So Joshua uses a secular book to show, I think, people who would not believe the Bible that I'm not the only one that wrote it, but Jasher did too. All right, let me give you one more example. Jude 14. Jude is canonical. It is in the Bible. It's toward the end of the Bible, close to the book of Revelation. It's only one chapter. In fact, I think last year, the year before, I did a verse by verse, phrase by phrase, word by almost word-by-word word exposition of this book on Sunday night. And we had notes, did the whole thing, and we had a good time with it. And it was also about these men that Enoch, Enoch. Now, Enoch is known for what? Who knows? What? He walked with God, but something else. Right. He did not die. He did not die. He went right from here right to there. Who was the other guy that didn't die? Elijah, right. Elijah and Enoch are the only ones that are recorded. Aha, remember that. There could have been others, but we don't know that. But we know for sure two men went from here to there. Now, we don't know how Enoch went. We know Elijah, he took chariots, right? the mode of transportation. Enoch, we don't know. The Bible says he walked with God and God took him. It's time to come home. Now, there is a book called First Enoch, One Enoch. A book called One Enoch. And Jude refers to that book in his writings. This is very fascinating. In the seventh generation from Adam, so if you take Adam and you go down seven generations, you come to Enoch. Prophesied saying... Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones. Now, what is the book of Enoch about? Well, we talked about the book of Jashar. We talked about that, that chronicles heroes in the wars of Israel. This book of Enoch is kind of different because what it does, it talks about the fallen angels. The fallen angels in the book of Genesis. It describes the fall of the angels and the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of men. And that is an exceptionally controversial part of the Bible, which we clearly enunciated when we went verse through verse through the book of Jude. Now, there are a couple of interpretations. One is that the sons of God were angels, fallen angels, who intermarried, with the daughters of men, and through them we got what's called Nephilim, or giants. And the book of Enoch talks about that. Now, we're not saying that's what happened. I'm not saying that's what happened, but I am saying a lot of theologians would take that position. And they have very, very good reason 
uh, to do that, right? Now, we see here that Enoch is referred to by Jude in this prophetic writing. It doesn't mean that he agrees necessarily everything that Enoch says, but he does refer to the part of prophecy, behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones. So once again, we have a clear example here of a book that is a secular book that's used in the Bible. In fact, this particular book of Enoch is whole, if you can read, Ethiopic or Ethiopian language, you can read it. It's the only language in which we have the book in its entirety. We call it in the Ethiopic language. So if you bone up on your Ethiopian, you could read it and tell us exactly what it says. Okay, but that's the only book that we have it, and it's what we call, the theologians call, in its extent. Extent simply means whole, full, complete. Okay? Now, something else. So we have two books. Paul refers to current poets when he wrote. Now, Paul in Acts chapter 17, interesting story, another great story. He goes into Athens, and the Athenians worshipped, I mean, all kinds of gods. And there was an altar there in the town square, and it was called the what? The unknown God, right? There was an altar there, and it's, they put it up because in case they had forgotten a god. <laughs> they had a god that was called the unknown God. And so Paul comes in and he shares with them, hey, I know who the unknown God is. His name is Jesus. That's the God you guys don't have. And so Paul, as he talks about this, for in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own secular non-Christian writers have said, for we also are his children. So Paul also uses people that are from the secular world. And he quotes these authors. He included a quotation from a Cretan poet, Epimenides. That's in Titus chapter 1, verse 12. And then he quotes from Epidemus here and Aratus in his speech in Athens in Acts chapter 17 and in verse 28. So Paul actually uses it once, and we find that Titus also in Titus chapter 1, verse 12, uses a poet, a secular poet. So as we look at the Bible, we see that these writers of the Bible used outside sources. Now, why did they do that? Well, first of all, I think to authenticate what they were doing. But second of all, to authenticate to those people that were lost and would never believe the Bible that there were other people at the time of their writings that were writing and thinking a lot alike, just like they were. Which is huge when we stop and think about it. Writers employed many literary devices not characteristic of a word-for-word -word dictation. Much of Scripture, for example is poetry, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, the Gospels, for example, are filled with parables. This part's not in your notes either. Paul employed allegory and hyperbole. Hyperbole just means exaggeration. You know, you know a storyteller that just exaggerates. We call that hyperbolic language. Oftentimes, another word could be substituted liar, okay? But, you know, people speak and they go, wait a minute, what? And then James uses, as I said earlier, metaphors and similes as he wrote about farmers and workers and those types of things. The Bible uses an inspiration, everyday language, language that people could understand. It wasn't written where people had a hard time understanding it. They wrote it just like we would write today in our modern language. Inspiration implies inerrancy. The word inerrant means without error. So we would believe that the Bible is inerrant in the context of the original autographs. 
We already showed you some challenges already in Kings and Chronicles, didn't we? And some of you were shocked. You said, I never saw that before. That's right. You haven't. That was a good, that was a good time. A couple of people almost passed out on us. What the Bible speaks on is an error. In other words, what the Bible addresses is without error. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is, let's read it together. You ready? One, two, three. Impossible for God to lie. Let's say that again. Impossible for God to lie. So, if the Bible truly is revelation, if it truly is inspired, it must be without error because God does not make mistakes. So we conclude, if the Bible is from God, it's true. Look at John 17, 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Are you ready? Your what? Word is truth. Now, if the Bible was not revealed from God, if it was not inspired by God, we should be home watching the Patriots. We're wasting our time. But we believe that it was verbally, plenarily inspired and preserved. There are no historical or scientific errors. Do you realize with all the bright professors and historians and researchers that they've not found one error in the Bible? In fact, the Bible is still proving historians and archaeologists we're still discovering lands that are in the Bible that they couldn't find, and now we're finding them, for example. It's fascinating. Don't you think if the Bible was full of errors, it'd be on the front page of the New York Times? It's not, though. There are no errors, historically or scientifically. God, by his providence, here's inspiration. Here's a simple definition. God, by his providence, you say, what's that? I'm going to show you, then we're going to close. Guided authors who as humans were capable of errors to refrain from error when writing his book. Well, Jerry, how did God do that? <laughs> it was a supernatural event that only God could do. So what's the providence of God? Last thing in our notes. In theology, the providence of God means this. It means that continuous activity, that ongoing activity of God, whereby God makes all the events of the physical, the mental, and moral realms, that encompasses, by the way, everything that God creates, work out for his purposes. And what is the purpose? It's nothing short of the original design of God in creation. In other words, God has created everything and he has structured everything to work out for his purposes. Now get this, not ours. For his glory. And if you stop and think about it as created beings, don't we want all things to work out for our creator's glory? Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for this lesson. We ask your blessings as we've studied this material that you would help us to grow closer to you. And Lord, this material provides us confidence, provides the confidence we need to share with others that we have the word of God and that you are a supernatural God who created all things and your word guides and leads and directs us in all that we do. And all of God's people said, Hey, amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. Test next week. Not really. All right. <laughs>